So um, let's go get started. My name is Del Spoonmore, and my wife and I, uh, we're the, we, we started from Seed to Spoon, which is what you all around here, this iPhone app stuff. Uh, we, it's an iPhone app that makes it easy to grow food by giving you exact planting dates that are, uh, that are based, on where you, uh, based on where you live. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Bill Ferris is the owner of Prairie Wind Nursery. I'm going to let him talk more about who he is. We've been uh, in the nursery business since 1990, and our emphasis is on culinary herbs. I think we've got the best selection of culinary herbs in, in uh, Oklahoma. We've got a lot of, you know, the regular, everyday, common stuff, but we've got a lot of different stuff, too, and things that we'll, some of it we'll talk about here today. We also grow a lot of native plants, uh, herbaceous perennials with an emphasis on native plants and prairie grasses uh, that kind of grew out of a philosophy of wanting to grow plants or produce plants for our customers that would thrive not just survive here in Oklahoma, as well as water conservation, you know, pest resistance and all those sorts of things. So over the years, we've kind of evolved into to what we, we do now. Uh, for many years, we were just a wholesale grower that supplied other nurseries, but in recent years, we've opened up and started doing more retail uh, business, and we do a lot of uh, workshops and events and that sort of thing. So we'd invite you to check out our uh, website at prairiewindnursery.com and look at the calendar and you can check out the plants we grow. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm sorry with the feedback situation. This has got to be chaos. Okay, good. Okay. All right. So let's just jump in and start talking about some herbs. So we're going to start over here on the left side and start with... See, I had them laid out alphabetically so we could do this. Oh, we're doing... No, oh. it's all right. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. No, no, no. It's... <laughs> See why Bill no, and I get along. Have at it. Rosemary. Rosemary. Well, if we're starting at Sage, if we're starting up at okay. the other side, right. we can't just jump in the middle. Okay, sure. And that's just chaos. Okay. So we well, start. No, make it tarragon then. <laughs> okay, let's start with Rosemary. So this is Rosemary, everybody. This is, uh, out of everything that we're going to smell today, this is my favorite smelling. I say we're going to smell this. Um, so Rosemary, Bill is really the expert in Rosemary. He does the test for OSU as far as seeing what does well here in Oklahoma. Uh, so he's been doing testing for a long time. Uh, I, my favorite way to use rosemary is actually to uh, dehydrate it and then make it into a powder and then sprinkle that on sweet potato fries or something like that. Uh, Bill, you want to talk more about how to grow ro rosemary and really a lot of the things we're, we're going to talk about with rosemary apply to pretty much everything. So we're going to talk about some of the basic just kind of care tips for herbs of this nature. Yeah. Herbs, Mediterranean herbs in general, which is going to include uh, rosemary, sage, uh, oregano, a lot of your other herbs, you got to think about where they come from originally, which is that Mediterranean climate, which is hot days, cool nights, that arid desert type, not a lot of rain, poor gravelly soils, a lot of things. So you can uh, really bear in mind, you know, you want to have really good drainage if you've got clay soils here in Oklahoma, a raised bed with a sand amendment in there so that you've got way for that water to get away. We can't control how much water we get sometimes. You'd either, you know, I've often said Oklahoma is a two state. It's either too hot or too dry or too wet or, or too windy or something every day and sometimes all within a week. But if you've got clay soils, if you know, you can uh, do the raised bed is the way to do it. Uh, we can't control the heat here either, but uh, you know, that'll all still help with that. Uh, you know, make sure that you've got that low fertility. You don't want to over fertilize these because they're used to growing in a pretty lean soil. Uh, so you, a lot of times they'll get too lush and too soft and you'll run in, into problems with them if you get too much fertility on these Mediterranean herbs. So with rosemary, another thing you can do with it is you see these stems, like especially some of these harder ones, they're really nice for making barbecue skewers. So there's a specific variety of rosemary called barbecue that has been bred to have more of those. But what you can do is you can cut that stem off and then fill the, the you know, kind of take them off and then you can use that as a skewer on, on the grill. Yeah, barbecue, yeah, it's a variety. Uh, he has it down to his nursery. And I want to mention again, Prairie Wind Nursery. He has more herbs than you'll find anywhere else. He, he specializes in this. Sure. Yeah. yeah, we have partners for Prairie Wind Nursery here too. Um, moths, oh, moths don't like them. Yeah, and, and let's talk about, like, so rosemary is a great companion plant, and a lot of these herbs we're going to talk about are great companion plants. And what that means 
is that they, these plants help other plants, and they do that through a couple. Let me get closer to the bill. So they do that through a couple of different ways. Um, one, pests find what they're looking for through their sense of smell. So if you have a bunch of tomatoes in a, in a row, the, the pests that look for tomatoes are going to have a really easy time finding that because they're all there together. But if you have things like this that smell really strong around all of that, then it creates a barrier where pests have a hard time and they, they can't find what they're looking for. And they're going to move on to the other garden that has everything together in a row. Now, it doesn't mean you're never going to have them, but it means that if the, if the pest finds one plant, they're not as likely to find all the other ones as well, and they're not going to spread through your entire garden and take it all. So in our raised beds, we have a mix of 30 to 40 percent of these spread all throughout to help with that. Not only with pest prevention, but also uh, things like rosemary and oregano have been proven to help improve the flavor of things grown around them and help them grow more vigorously. So they're just super plants, if you, if you will. And, and if you, once you start to eat them, uh, you'll really you'll start to quickly realize that the reason for that too is that they're really good for you. Um, and the nutritional benefits you get from these plants are unsurpassed by anything else really. These they have more antioxidants and, and other good things than, uh, than most anything else you can grow and eat. Yeah, and the rosemary, all these very fragrant herbs, uh, the sage, uh, rosemary, oregano, or deer don't like them. So the deer won't eat them, and if you, that's a. Well, it depends on what you're growing, really. Um, so tomatoes and basil really go well together. Uh, I, I typically have my rosemary around a lot of my broccolis and some other things like that because they help with more of the cabbage moss. So, um, in, in, in our app, the companion plant section shows you, but really, you can't go wrong putting rosemary or oregano next to anything. Uh, they're going to help out everything. So, um, And another thing to consider with companions, too, is time of growing season. So rosemary uh, is doing pretty well in the spring whenever broccoli is. Basil can't get going yet. So basil would not be a good companion to that. So that's why rosemary is traditionally a good companion for me for springtime crops. And then basil really takes over as my summer companion, as well as tarragon and some other like things we're going to talk about that are more summertime. But the, rosemary is something that does really, really well throughout the winter. So it, it'll survive most winters here in Oklahoma. Yeah, and then what I would do is just have a mix of them everywhere. And then um, at the end of this, we're going to be showing how you can actually take one plant and propagate it into more plants. So that's what I do is I'll start with one and then I make more. And then by the time, you know, now we have them everywhere. They're taking over a whole garden. So yeah. that's our strategy with them. Yep. Yeah. We're actually trialing uh, six different types of so-called hardy rosemaries to try to determine which is are truly the hardiest. Uh, we've had a little rough start. Uh, the first year was three winters ago, uh, and I planted some in the midsummer. Uh, the six different varieties, let's see if I can name them. There's uh, Art, Inferno, and Hill Hardy, uh, Salem, Garizia, and Tuscan Blue. Uh, that first year was the year that uh, we went from some, in the 60 degrees down into the single digits within about three days, actually on down into four below zero and then back up into the 60s the next week, and then back down into the single digits again. So I, I wound up with one plant that survived that, that test, and it was an ARP rosemary, and it, it's still alive. Uh, the next year, which was last winter, we replanted the same thing, and we had a, almost the same situation, not quite as bad, and we probably lost about half of the rosemaries that time. Now, so far this year, we haven't had any of those extreme events like that, and so we're doing pretty good. We've got about a 95% survival rate now, but it looks like the ARP is going to be, turn out to be the, the hardiest of all. But I think it also depends, too, on the maturity of the plant. If you can get them to survive one winter and then they get established, then their likelihood of, of them surviving more longer uh, then, uh, is a lot better. I actually have a uh, Ferno rosemary that is at my house. It's been there since 2001, but it's on a big berm and uh, uh, really well drained soil. Our sandy, our soil is sandy out there anyway, uh, but they can live for a long, long time if you can find a happy spot for them. And most of every... uh, yeah. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize when you're cooking with these, there's a lot of subtle differences in the flavors of them. Uh, you know, uh, I've written a little paper about those six different varieties and the difference in the uh, flavors, the nuances. ARP is very, very strong, very high oil content. So if you really like the flavor of rosemary and if you 
food, that's one to go for. Uh, Furneaux, Salem, uh, Hill Hardy, uh, those others are a lot more of a milder. There's still some differences in there. We, the one we call Gorizia is a very big, bold, upright, almost columnar growing rosemary with a big, thick, long strap kind of a leaf. And it has a very spicy floral fragrance and aroma to it. So you it'd be one of those things you just have to taste test uh, to see whether you, which which flavor you really like. And the grizzly, is, the the stems on it will be almost as big as a pencil, or so so it, it works really good for using for a skewer for barbecues as well. But you better test the flavor of it before you try. It. Any questions about rosemary before we move on to the next plant? All right, so we're going to continue down with the same type of plant. Uh, meaning the ones that are perennial to come back year for year. Uh, so let's move into sage. So sage is very similar to rosemary. Uh, another thing about rosemary that I didn't mention is it can be really overpowering in recipes. The sage is the same way. When you first start using these in cooking, uh, don't overdo it. We'll talk about some later that are a little safer, but with these, you can really overpower in a hurry. Um, sage is, an, is, is something that, again, comes back year after year. Most varieties, like uh, some, like pineapple sage, don't typically handle our winters very well, but uh, this garden sage here, and um, or this is blue silver, That's and blue then silver. the garden sage uh, does does well in, in our Oklahoma winters. Uh, as far as how we use sage, uh, I'm sure everyone knows about how to use it with Thanksgiving and you know stuffing with turkey and things like that. But we found that our favorite way to use sage is actually to make a pesto from it, like you would make with basil. So we take sage leaves, we combine that with olive oil, Parmesan cheese, pine nuts. I think that's it. Yep, that's pretty much it. And you run that in a blender, and then that pesto is what we throw on to beans and rice and wraps and sandwiches and burgers, and we put that on everything. Uh, we love that pesto. Um, another thing I want to mention with sage is in June, it will go to flower, and those uh, purple flowers smell incredibly good, and they really help with anxiety relief. So I work from home a lot, and when I'm stuck on a coating problem and I can't figure it out and I'm all stressed out, I go out in the garden and I bear hug my sage plant. I'm not kidding. And I just smell it and I start feeling better and ideas come to me and I go inside and start coating. So that's literally my coating process is to go bear hug my sage when I'm stressed out and it works. So you want to talk more about sage, Bill? Well, sage, again, the same growing conditions, that very well drained soil. This particular sage is one that we call blue silver. It's a, a sterile hybrid sage. The fragrance and flavor of it is really, really strong and it's a giant size sage. It gets uh, at least waist high. Uh, our favorite way to use uh, sages is with white beans. You can throw four or five light leaves in there and some, turn some plain old beans into a nice little dish. One of the other things that I'll, we throw in there that people don't think about is winter savory. Uh, winter savory is, is, is uh, before the Europeans, the, the spice roads to, to get real black pepper uh, the winter savory is what they use to spice up dishes, but winter savory and sage goes really good with your white uh, northern beans. Awesome. I didn't know that about winter savory. Yeah. Because I have it in my garden, and it just kind of sits there, and I kind of use it, but I'm looking for recipes. Yeah. Well, so, awesome. Beans is a good way to do it. Winter savory? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it reduces the musical aspects of the beans. <laughs> So next we're going to move on to, again, very similar to these, oregano. So oregano tolerates winters very well here in Oklahoma, tolerates summers here. Oregano is the easiest thing you can grow, pretty, besides chives. Chives and oregano are both really, really easy. It's a great thing to start with. Um, oregano, too, is the thing that's really been proven to improve the flavor of everything else around it. Um, to help with companion planting, it's, it's really, it's one of those super plants. It's also something that's great to give to dogs. You want to throw some stuff into a dog into your dog food. It's something that's really good for them. Um, as far as how we use oregano in our kitchen, um, obviously you use it with making pizza, uh, pasta, things like that. You can add in some flavor, but you can also make uh, pesto from it in the same way we mentioned with sage. So with pretty much all these things, you're gonna hear pesto a lot today. So you make a lot of pesto, but it tastes radically different from herb to herb. Um, Bill, you want to talk more about how to grow oregano? And yeah, well, it's it's. Growing it's like all the other Mediterraneans, just that good good drainage and full sun. We grow three, four basic types of, of oregano. First is the uh, Greek oregano, which is generally what you'll hear called for in the recipes, what the chefs talk about. And I think that then, it is, but 
the, the Greek oregano looks just like this. This happens to be one called hot and spicy, and it is just exactly what it sounds like. It is hot and spicy. It's got a real nice peppery kick to it, so if you like a little more uh, spice to your food than that, then uh, Greek oregano is just a traditional oregano. This is one that's my favorite. This is Italian oregano, which is actually a cross between Greek oregano and sweet marjoram. So it's kind of in that middle ground in there. It's got a really good flavor to it, not too sweet, not too spicy. Uh, the uh, There's something here, and this is called Cuban oregano. You know, I thought I'd talk about it a little bit today. It's not really a uh, an oregano, it's a plectranthus. But the Cubans do use this in food, and it's very potent. A little dab will do you if you remember brill cream. Uh, but you can use that to uh, spice up dishes. The uh, way we use oregano a lot is we're all about real uh, efficient, quick and easy recipes. So if you don't have time to make a spaghetti sauce or from uh, scratch or marinara, you can go down and get your ragu for off of the shelf and you bring it home. You throw a handful of fresh oregano in there and a handful of basil or some parsley in there and then you can claim it's homemade and it tastes like homemade. <laughs> and uh, you can, you, you know, uh, obviously homemade's the best, but you know, you can really make simple recipes, really good recipes from something like that with the throwing in fresh herbs. And it doesn't have to be difficult. You know, a lot of times you see these recipes, they look really uh, complicated or see the chef on television making things and you say how in the world can I do that? It's really all about just grabbing a handful and throwing it in the spaghetti sauce or, or the pasta or whatever you're doing. Any questions about any of these when we move on to the next? Alright, so... And you thought we weren't going to have a crowd. Look at this, Dale. <laughs> we well, started there's no one here. Huh? Yeah. So I guess we're not going to have a pasta then. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is mint. So we're moving on to mint now. and. Uh, mint is again another one that will come back year for year. Uh, in fact, it will take over your entire garden if you let it. You've got to be careful with mint. Um, that doesn't mean you can't plant it with other plants. It just means if you're going to do it, plant it like in the container and leave it in the container. Um, but what I do with, with mint is I'll have it in its own container. So either its own raised bed where the whole thing is going to be mint or in a smart pot where it can't really get out. But even in smart pots, I've had it go out and root into my grass and take over. But I'm fine with it because I'd rather have that than crabgrass, so it works out. If I have a lot of mint, I'll be happy and just mow and it smells like mint every day. Yeah. So um, another thing about mint, it's a great companion plant. It helps um, repel mice especially. So if you have mice issues in your garden, they help repel them. So in an area that we had a lot of mice issues, we planted a bunch of it and they went away. Now we also got a cat in the process, so who knows which one has the most to do with it. Um, mint is something that has, there's a lot of different varieties out there for mint. So Bill has, I mean, uh, over eight, 10, eight, eight uh, different types of mint. Somewhere. Uh, so this is the mojito mint, there's the apple mint, there's orange, wine mint. Orange mint, lime mint, peppermint, uh, blue balsam, candy mint. Spearmint. Spearmint, but uh, mint. The, the mojito mint. So and the like Forrest Gump now, is what we Yeah, mean. yeah. So, um, as far as how you use mint, this is not something we cook with a lot, but we do use it a lot to make drinks. So in the summer, whenever it's really, really hot, and water just isn't cutting it, I want something sweet. Um, what I'll do is I'll fill up uh, one of those really big ice, uh, one of those really big glass uh, jugs with water, ice, squeeze lemon, and then put mint in there and let it sit for a few hours and kind of soak in. And then that drink tastes really, really good. So um, that's typically what we use mint for. Carrie also makes toothpaste out of it, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, you can do some cool stuff with it. What else do you want to talk about? With well, mint? we uh, I do a real refreshing drink in the summertime. It's kind of like what you talked about. We have a big glass jug with a spigot on it, and you put some lemon in there and put the uh, spearmint or the Kentucky kernel mint is what I like uh, with the lemons and uh, a li some lemon balm and then fill it the rest of the way up with water and ice cubes and it's a real refreshing drink, you know, no sugar in there. Uh, of course, the Kentucky kernel and the mojitos are good for cocktail hour. Uh, but other mint uses is in uh, tabbouleh is generally calls for a certain amount of mint. Uh, but mostly they're for teas. You could dry them and store them or use them fresh. It, all, it also makes you feel, so when I first started growing, I felt like a failure often with tomatoes, but mint just makes you feel like a winner all the time because it's just always sprouting. 
it's good to have some plants like that in your repertoire that is always produced to help with your confidence level when you're starting out. So yep. mint, garlic, and chives are the go-tos for your confidence builders early on. And I've got a couple of friends that raise chickens, and anytime we've got excess mint, they come and cut the mint back and put it in their chicken coops, and it runs all the mites out of the, the chicken coop. So those volatile oils, the bugs don't like those volatile oils. Okay, so we're getting close to running out of the things that are perennial. So let's move on to one of our last perennial things, and that's parsley. It's a baby right now, so you can barely tell what it is. But um, parsley is not something I've used traditionally a lot of. I'm trying to use more of it, so I've been listening to Bill a lot about how he uses it. So in that light, I'm going to actually turn it over to him and let him talk more about parsley. Well, we, we grow three different kinds of parsley. Uh, you know, this cur curly parsley is generally used more as a garnish on the side of the plate. Uh, all your recipes and, and the chefs will use the... Uh, Italian flat leaf parsley. I uh, we grow one that's called an Italian Giant, and it's just kind of it's a big flat leaf, really good flavored parsley. Uh, I think maybe parsley is kind of an acquired taste for some people, but I like to just throw it in the spaghetti sauce. Uh, you know, it's good in, in uh, tabbouleh and things like that. Uh, there's also the root parsley, and do we have it handy? Yeah, it's up here. Oh, I want to pass this tag around so you can get an idea of can you all see that those little carrot root structures on there this parsley that you can eat the top of it just as well but it forms these little and they're usually about this long and they look a little like little white carrots and you can clean those up and dice them up and use them in your soups and stews but parsley's are biennials so generally speaking you're going to plant it one year, it's going to winter one year, and then the next spring it will bolt and go to seed, so you'll have to plant it every every other year. Okay, any questions on parsley? Alrighty, what are we moving on to, Dale? All right, so let's talk about what's... Um... Sure. Okay, so let's move on. I think this is the last one that's perennial. So chives. These are chives. We have garlic chives and we have onion chives. And chives are very similar to onions, very similar flavor, but they have key differences in how they're grown. So with onions, you know, they're grown for the bulbs. If you were to cut the tops off, that would limit the bulb growth. So you would not get as large bulbs. You don't really want to do that. So I love to have green onions. So when I first started growing onions, I learned that. That's whenever I understood why there are different types that you grow. So that's where chives come in. Because chives, you're mint. They're grown for the purpose of harvesting the tops. They're perennial. They come back year after year. You give it a haircut, it spits new ones out. It's really easy to grow. It'll take over an area, like I said, just like I mentioned with, with mint. Although not as fast, you don't have to worry about it. But it, it spreads voraciously. Um, it's also a great companion plant, uh, chives are. And what we do with chives is we will surround our garden, so put a border of chives around it um, just to help with companion planting and it also they don't get in the way of other things so I'm trying to reach into my garden it's just that barrier down the front and then as pests kind of come into the garden they think it's a garden of chives and they move on. Um, Bill you want to talk more about chives? Yeah everybody should grow chives because chives are easy and if you have chives once you'll have chives forever they don't they just get bigger and easier all the time. Uh, chives are good with eggs chives are good with potatoes chives can go good in your chicken salad or your tuna salad but the, my favorite part and the best part of chives is when they bloom that lilac purple flower is eat the flowers. They are very, very tasty and you can eat them whole, mix them in salads or crumble them up and put them in your salads or any soup dishes or anything like that. But that's my favorite part is the flowers. Yes, ma'am. Pardon? No, probably be good for them. Probably be good for them. You know, all of these things in the Allium family are really good for you. The garlic and... There are the two different uh, flavors of chives. There's the, the the onion chives and then the garlic chives. If you like that that garlic, uh, it'll keep the the uh, vampires and all away. <laughs> what? Any questions about chives? Before we move on to the next one. All right. So let's move on to fennel. Yeah. So Bill, let's this talk is about this fennel. one's deal. Bill, okay, talk about fennel and dill. Okay. Well. Everybody knows that dill is good uh, for pickles, but it's also good to sprinkle on fish. Uh, it's good to sprinkle on uh, eggs, egg salads, and things like that. There's a lot of different uses for it. It's also a great uh, food source for your swallowtail uh, butterflies. Uh, very, very easy to grow. Uh, generally speaking, if you'll let this go to seed, 
it'll reproduce every year so you don't have to buy it. So you, you, they may have more of a problem keeping it contained than anything. Uh, but it, it's a very versatile, uh, you can use it in soups, one thing and another. And then the fennel, everybody knows that the fennel seed is the flavor in Italian sausage. And, and uh, you know, it's used on pizzas and that sort of thing, a lot of your Italian cooking. But it, it's also in that same family where it's a great food source for the swallowtails. Uh, real easy to grow, like dill. If you plant it one time, let it go to seed, it'll, you'll probably have it from, from then on. But anybody got a question about them? Alrighty. All right, so we have two more herbs we're going to talk about, and then we're going to give away some smart pots, and then we're going to show you how you can take an herb and actually make a new plant out of it. So uh, if you don't have a ticket yet, uh, get a ticket just from today. She'll give you a ticket for the smart pots drawing. We'll be doing that uh, here in just a few minutes. So let's move on to talking about cilantro. So this is the cilantro that I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, and uh, I love to use cilantro. It's one of my favorite things to grow, but unfortunately in Oklahoma, it's a very difficult thing to grow because it does not like the heat, it does not like the cold. We have a growing window of like two minutes for it, it seems. <laughs> and um, so once I met Bill, he introduced me to this Vietnamese cilantro, which is not related to cilantro at all, but it tastes like it. And it grows really well in the summer. So this is what we switch to in the summer uh, for salsa recipes. Now, uh, it's called um, Vietnamese cilantro or Rao Ram is what it's called there. Uh, we have it in our app as well, so if you download our app, it's listed in there. But it's it does really well in the summer. I mean, it thrives. This is one of the one of the best things that we have in our garden. that's thriving in the middle of July when everything else is dying off. Now, I do not like to taste as much fresh as I do this cilantro. I like to mix this more in with other things that are you know stir fried a little bit or things like that. But it's uh, used a lot in stir fries and uh, over where it comes from. Um, Bill has an interesting story about how this kind of got introduced over here. Well. Most of us associate cilantro, coriander, with uh, Mexican food, South American, Central American food. Well, it's not native, that's not where it came from. One of the other common names for uh, uh, coriander and cilantro is Chinese parsley. And how it got to South America when the back in the 1500s when uh, the Spaniards had expended all the native labor force in the gold mines down in South America, they started importing Chinese workers, laborers, to work the, the uh, uh, gold mines down there and that's how uh, Chinese parsley became cilantro but, but before that there was two plants that the Central South Americans used in their food spice their food up one is called papalo and one is called papicha and they have that cilantro cumin's type of flavor to them we grow both of those but they're both of those are very warm season uh, plants and it's really hard to get them started so we won't start them to later on but the good part is, is that they come on like Vietnamese cilantro. About the time your regular cilantro is bolting and going to seed, that's when these others are taken off. And you just use them fresh just like you would any. And there, a lot of people that I've introduced to Papalo really love that, the flavor of it because it's a little bit different than, than regular cilantro, but it's a very unique flavor. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the whole idea of using it. And I have, you know, this is a personal flavor issue. Everybody likes something a little bit different. I have friends that actually prefer the Vietnamese cilantro over the regular cilantro. Dale, you know, is not, not quite as fond of it as others. But, that, you know, everybody likes, has different tastes when it comes to that. But the, the papalo, the papicha, and the Vietnamese cilantro will all thrive in the heat. The Vietnamese cilantro likes a little extra moisture. It's not cold hardy or as the others are either, but uh, they really thrive in the heat. With a little extra water, you plant one plant, it'll definitely last you all summer long. I want to mention another thing about cilantro as well, is uh, coriander is actually the seed that comes from cilantro, and that's actually something you can use in cooking as well. So once cilantro goes to seed, you let that seed harden a little bit, and it's really nice to throw that in wraps and in salads, it adds a little bit of crunch. And I really like having those too. So it's not completely useless once it goes seed. Also, you can let the seeds drop and they'll come up as new plants. So in our cilantro beds, there's continual cilantro beds that are just constantly uh, coming and going. So the last one that we have to talk about today before we give on to the, the Smart Pots giveaway is basil. So basil is something that Bill has a lot of in his nursery as well. It's 14 different types and it's something that can be very versatile. Um, every flavor of basil tastes radically different. 
and it's something you can use to, to really change your build from build to build. And I, I wanted to talk about briefly how we got into using herbs, because this is a, a big deal for us, was that when we first started growing food, we were having a lot of zucchini coming out of the garden and things like that. And it was really cool in the beginning, but then after like two weeks, it was like, okay, I'm tired of eating the same zucchini every single day. How do I make this taste different? And that's when we started using these, because we would take um, a handful of lime basil with the zucchini one day, and then the next day we would add oregano, or we'd add rosemary, or different types of basil. We would, every day we had, or every meal, we had a different flavor to it, and then it didn't seem like we were eating the same thing every day. It tasted different. And it really allowed us to make the, a more sustainable way of eating this whole approach of trying to grow our own food. And not only us, but our kids and other people, you know, it's more than that. We have four kids, we've got to try and talk to them this stuff as well. So when we can make it taste a little bit different. And the nice thing about basil is there's some really mild flavors. So when you're introducing the kids, sometimes they don't like the harshness of the sage and the rosemary. It's hard to get them to eat it. But some of the, the lime basil and the lettuce leaf basil, the sweet basil, so some things like that are a really easy way to get kids into eating some of this stuff. Bill, you want to talk more about basils and specifically some of these we have here? Yeah, sure. And, of course, the number one reason to grow basil is pesto. And that's all you need to know, just pesto. <laughs> That's a meal for me, some, some good crackers and bread and pesto, and that I'm done. I'm good. But we do grow 12, 14 different varieties. It, it, it varies from year to year. We are always exper experimenting with new, new varieties. Uh, this particular one right here is called African Blue Basil. It's not the best culinary basil out there. Uh, it has a little bit more of that, that clovey uh, uh, sort of flavor to it, a little too strong for me. But this is a, a uh, sterile hybrid plant that does not produce seeds, so it never stops flowering all season long. So it makes a great ornamental, and honeybees love this plant. They will just flock to this plant and then just camp out on it all from daylight till dark. As with they do, they like all the basil's, but all the basil's, you know, usually they'll uh, grow for a little ways and then they flower and then they're done. Whereas this one just continually flowers all season long. Makes a huge plant, gets three feet tall and three feet in diameter. Uh, these are a little bit small for demonstration purposes. One of my favorites, it's become one of my favorites. This is called lettuce leaf basil. And the leaves on this plant will literally be as big as my hand. So if you're trying to make a lot of high volume pesto or you want to just use it in place of lettuce on a sandwich, it's, it's great for that. It grows really good here. A lot of your purple basils generally are, are used more for color or texture in salads and dishes like that, fresh vegetable dishes. But the number, well, the, the top sellers that we have are just good old sweet Italian basil and Genovese basil and then Thai basil comes in at number three. And Thai basil has the uh, uh, more of a licorice sort of flavor to it, so people that really prefer those kind of flavors, uh, it, it is uh, the number three. And then the rest of them, we've got lemon basil and lime basil. And basically, you can just you know, change your pestos up or your pasta dishes by using these, these naturally flavored uh, uh, basils like that. We grow cinnamon basil. Uh, we grow different kinds of Genovese basil, some that are more compact. And one of the things that's happened in recent years, and we don't know exactly where this came from, but there's a, a, a fungal disease called downy mildew that uh, attacks basil. So if you start to see this black powdery stuff underneath your the leaves uh, of your basil, that's probably what it is. So we're searching out varieties now that are resistant to this downy mildew. So we're experimenting with some new new varieties. One of them that I really, really like is called Dolce Fresca. It's a Genovese type basil, but it's nice and compact and produces a lot of leaves. Uh, so you might want to think about trying that out. No, it's a large leaf, but it's just a smaller plant. A more, It probably gets, you know, 18 inches tall as opposed to two feet tall of a regular basil. So it's just not uh, a lot of leaf structure on it in a compact plant. Of the what? There's, there is globe, spicy globe basil, and it has small leaves, and it's a little mounding plant. We do grow it, uh, but it's got a little bit of a kind of a, a spicy flavor to it. Yeah. But there's, if you look at the seed catalogs, the commercial seed catalogs, you know, that's probably the largest section of seed in the catalog is the different types of basil. There's no, I don't know that we could grow all of the basils that there are out there to try, but they all have, you know, subtle differences to them the way they grow and the flavors that they have.
All right, any questions about anything we talked about here before we move on to smart pots? So these are smart pots, and if you're not familiar with them, they are fabric raised beds that are made here in Oklahoma City, actually. And I first heard about these a couple years ago now from a friend of mine who's a professor over at OSU. He was raving about them, and when I first heard of them, I thought, no way is this thing going to work in Oklahoma because it gets way too hot and this black fabric is going to absorb heat. But I did testing. I even buried one side next to one that was not buried because I was so skeptical of it. And I was proven wrong. These things uh, have really have done a really great job in my backyard. And the reason for that is because they can breathe through the side. So plants are able to get air from all sides, not just from the top. And that really has a huge impact on them. Um, also, we've seen where plants don't circle. So once they hit the sides of the container, they don't start circling like they do in other containers. Because they're able to get oxygen from there, they just form these tiny little capillaries. And then they start sucking in oxygen from all around. So this is a seven-gallon smart pot. And they've got all different sizes. We're giving away uh, in our app. If you go to a vegetable, we have the right size smart pot for that vegetable listed at the very bottom, as well as they have some larger raised beds that you can fit multiple things into. Um, but anyway, the seven gallon is a great size for pretty much any herb. Uh, it's a good one to get started with. It'll fit pretty much one of anything. The smart pots come in all those different sizes, but if you have really lousy. Uh, soil, it's a, just an automatic raised bed. You know, just fill it up with compost, potting soil, and you're good to go. Then you can move it around. You can do it on the concrete patio or the driveway or set it on the Bermuda grass because the Bermuda grass won't come up through it. Um, you know, the question, it, yeah. the question I have is about mint. So, like, this would be a great thing to grow mint in because it's a container, you know, it's not going to get out of it. Uh, rosemary also does really well in these because it does not like to have its feet wet and these drain well. So, um, so anyway, this is the lavender. Lavender is just like rosemary, so it does great in this too. Yeah, I'm actually growing trees in them at the nursery. So they're very, we've very. We've grown versatile. everything in them. Like we've we've tried, we've tested pretty much one of everything in a smart pot, and we have had anything where like not worth growing in it. It's it's a great solution. I love how portable they are. Another thing you can do in the summer is whenever it gets really really hot, you can take these and put them inside of a kiddie pool and fill that kiddie pool with like an inch or two of water and then it sub-irrigates. So you don't want to put too much in there where it drowns uh, and stays stays wet. But if it drinks it over a day, that's what you're looking for. You can just fill it up with an inch in the morning before you go to work. And, and then so that's... If you're growing cool season uh, crops like lettuces and, and greens and cilantros and that sort of stuff, and you get them started out in the full sun, and then you can extend the life a little bit by dragging them up in the shade for the afternoon, move them around you know, for sun exposure. So without further ado, we've got a, we've got tickets have been given out. If you don't have a ticket, have a ticket. Okay. All right. First ticket. Yeah. One fifty three. Last three did this. One fifty three. All right. Next one. Is another seven gallon here. One seventy two. Right next to each other. Take them up a little bit. Okay, so this is a 15. So um, this is, if you wanted to grow like a really big tomato, pretty much you can throw pretty much anything in here. It'll grow cucumber, uh, anything that gets large, or you could put a couple different things in here. So like two or three different herbs, maybe have a little kitchen herb, kitchen collection. Uh, these are really nice for that. Uh, potatoes also. The nice thing about growing potatoes and sweet potatoes in these is whenever it comes time to harvest, you dump this out in the container and then get your potatoes out. And whenever I was growing potatoes in the ground, I would ruin like half of the cementation I'm trying to dig and I end up cutting a potato. So that's how you can prevent yourself from doing that. And the kids love it when I just dump these into a barrel and they're digging for potatoes. They love it. So this is a 15 gallon. And Lucky number 162. All right. <laughs> so we got okay, we got another one, Vanna. Next up is 155. So again, like the 15, just even more, more potatoes. Okay. Ready? Yes. There you go. 173. All right. Yes, sir. All right. 
How many gallons? Thank you everyone for coming. That's a 20 gallon. Thank you for coming. If you have any other questions, go to Instagram. We have another class you at bet. 1 o'clock. Um, at 4 o'clock, I'm going to be talking about how to start growing food. So, uh, not just herbs, but all the other vegetables right over at that stage at 4 o'clock. Um, and if you miss it, it'll be on our website. Tonight. Pick up our business tonight, cards, so check out the website, come see us at the nursery. And uh, thank you all for coming out. Appreciate thank you, it. Everyone. Thank you.